almost did not have a show today. You wanna know why? I already had to change my shirt this morning because it was covered in blood. Bah. <laughs> uh, we were playing with the kids in the morning. Actually, I went back to wake up my wife. I'll tell you the way every, every day goes for the most part. I wake up at 6.30 with James. We hang out for like 20 or 30 minutes. I get breakfast together for the most part, to the best I can. Then we go and get um, Thomas. Then we play for another 20 or 30 minutes. And then we go get Amy. Time for her to wake up. And so while I, we were getting Amy, Thomas came up front, took all the cushions off the floor, off the couch, threw them on the floor, and then go run and jump in the cushions. So fine, kids are gonna run and jump in the cushions. Well, as soon as James decided to run and jump into the cushion, he jumped into one of the, uh, the cabinet that like, has the like, DVD player in it and you know cable box in it, and he cut his head in two little places. And then he bled all over the place, bled all over my shirt, bled all over the couch cushions, bled all over the floor. And um, then we had to deal with that. So that was fun. Um, but he's fine. James is fine. We read online, apparently, if uh, a kid does hit their head, they're often going to bleed a lot. They're going to have a bump, a big bump. And um, as long as they don't lose consciousness, as long as they can still see straight, as long as they can talk to you coherently, they're fine. They, it says, it just says, observe them for a few hours. I says, it says, the internet says, observe your kids for a few hours and they'll probably, or for 24 hours and they'll be okay. So anyway, he's okay. It was funny, his uh, grandpa came in because his grandpa was going to watch him today. And as soon as his grandpa came in, he started screaming his head off. Oh, my head, my head. But like, <laughs> he was fine for 20 minutes before that. Um, but anyway, he's okay. Everything's good. Everything's good. So today, we're going to talk about how and when to make exploitative folds. Exploitative folds, for the most part, means a big fold. Go ahead and think about when do you make big folds? We're gonna see if it lines up with uh, what, what we recommend here. Also, if you have any um, ideas for a little coffee episodes, a little coffee, a little coffee topics, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. I would love to hear those. Um, also, I have a new book before we get started, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Check it out at jlpoker.com slash tough. That book needs some reviews on Amazon and on Goodreads. It only has a few. I wanna thank all of you who have left reviews so far. But if we could get even two or three of you to go leave a review, it doesn't take long. It takes, you know, one minute. I would appreciate one minute of your time to let people know the book is good. All right. So today, when to make exploitative folds. First things first, most importantly, what is the opponent's strategy? Okay. Should be common sense. Um, I'm going to go through the spots where you should not make big folds, and we're going to discuss where to make big folds later. So you should not make good folds against good, strong, world-class opponents because they're gonna bluff you sometimes. You should also not make big folds against maniacs, people who like to bet and raise and re-raise and apply aggression. There is an exception to this though against maniacs because some maniacs only apply aggression on specific betting rounds like pre-flop or on the flop or on the turn and they do not all necessarily apply a lot of aggression on the river. Maybe they think that everybody folds by the turn, let's say. So if you call their turn bet, they just don't bluff the river very often. And to be fair, I actually think this is a pretty good strategy. This is how a lot of the maniacs win at poker, is their opponents think that they're bluffing on all betting rounds, whereas in reality, they're just bluffing a lot, pre-flopping on the flop and on the turn. And if you call their turn bet, they tend to only bet the river with good hands. And that's gonna result in you paying them off poorly for the biggest bet, more often than not, right? So typically you don't want to be um, calling against those players so often, but most of the time I think you're gonna find most people who are like good maniacs, most good maniacs tend to just blast it and keep going. Um, when I say good maniacs, what is a good maniac, you know? Quantified as you'd like. So anyway, if your opponent typically plays very well or if they play generally aggressively, you just don't wanna make big folds against them in general. So when should you make Big folds. Well, you should often be making big folds against tight players across the board. If you know someone only re-raises the best hands pre-flop and you're not getting the right implied odds to call, you should fold. If you have a hand that's very likely to be dominated, like uh, king-queen offsuit, ace-jack offsuit, you should fold, right? Um, there was a hand that a student sent me the other day where someone raised, a student called on the button, and then a player who had very, very tight stats, three bet from the small blind. So it went two big blinds call, like 10 big blinds from the small blind. 
they were playing 80 or 90 big blinds deep, so pretty deep stacked. The initial raiser called, and our hero called with the king-queen, and I think that's a spot where you just need to fold. It's unfortunate, you don't want to fold the king-queen, but I can pretty much guarantee you that one of your two opponents is going to have you in pretty bad shape, and that's not where you want to be. Are we not live on Twitch today? We seem to not be live on Twitch today. Hmm. If we're live on Twitch, let me know. Let's see. No, it says we're live on Twitch. Okay, never mind. Yeah, okay, cool, good. Maybe just no one's watching today. Huh, it says I'm only live on three out of four channels, but it looks like I'm live on all four channels. All right, whatever. Sometimes it fibs to me. Thank you all for being here, by the way. I appreciate it. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, as Thomas Bold says. Hello to everyone who is here from the UK, from India, everybody on Twitch. I'm glad that you all are here. Okay, so if someone is generally tight and passive, you need to fold, because let's say you do have the king-queen, and you end up seeing a three-way flop, and you flop a king or a queen. If either one of your opponents, the pre-flop raiser or the three-better, bet the flop, bet the turn, and bet the river, like you, you probably need to fold the king-queen because you're going to be super dominated in those scenarios. So you're only really happy when you get two pair, and that's very unlikely to happen, given you're likely to be against two big cards. What about king-queen suited? I would call king-queen suited there. King-queen suited would be a much better hand to call with because it can make some nut hands, right? But you want to shy away from hands that are going to be very likely to be dominated. Like if you had ace-jack offsuit in the same scenario. If you decided to call the three, the initial raise, you should just fold to the three bet. Get out of the way and sidestep these very, very difficult scenarios. You do not want to be in difficult spots where you're very likely to be dominated because you're just going to get crushed a lot of the time when you are beat. The other side of the coin there is that whenever you have the best hand, like say it does come ace-9-3 and you have ace-jack, and you have the best hand, what do your opponents likely have? Well, they likely have under pairs, right? And if they have under pairs, they're going to be somewhat unlikely to want to put a lot of money into the pot. So you end up losing big pots, and they and you end up winning small pots, and that's not the scenario you want to be in. Even getting good odds, even being in position, just get out of the way. Um, a lot of the nitty players, they are really passive and really tight, especially on the turn and the river. Some tight players raise reasonably... A reasonable range is pre-flop. They'll bet the flop reasonably, usually with almost everything. And then they'll play very straightforwardly on the turn and or the river. And I think you're going to find when tight players bet the turn and the river, you want to start making pretty big folds, right? So that is definitely something that you want to do. Like, say you do have um, king-queen suited. Good example. Let's say tight player raises, you call on the button, king-queen suited, as you should, I mean, pretty much any stack depth. Flop comes, whatever, king, seven, three. They bet the flop, you call. Turns a blank, let's say a two. They bet again, you call. On most rivers, if they bet again on the river, and you know that they are tight, and you know they don't do a whole lot of turn and river bluffing, you have to ask, like, what am I really beating on the river? Well, you're beating king, jack, and then overplayed hands. So if your opponent does not tend to overplay hands, then you should probably fold, because what are they really betting here? They're not overvaluing, and they don't do a whole lot of bluffing, so that means that they're more likely to have just good, strong hands. So if you have good, strong hands, then it's close. It's close with king-queen. If you had, like, king-10 suited, definitely fold, right? Or if you had pocket queens on king-blank-blank, blank, definitely fold. Um, but a lot of players make the mistake of just automatically paying off there, because they... You know, to some to some extent, correctly assume that king queen is one of the best hands in my range, and therefore I have to call with it. Which is true against a good player. Against a good player, you'd never fold king queen on a king high board, and assuming they just bet flop, bet turn, bet river, right? Easy call down. But against a tight player, you should at least consider it. And I'm not going to even necessarily say king queen is a fold, but like king ten suit, it's definitely a fold. And if you're paying off in that scenario, you're usually just calling way too often. Now, the one exception to this rule against tight players is that if they overvalue hands, then you should be way more inclined to call. Like, let's say on king, queen, three. I'm sorry, let's say on king, king, seven, three. If they just think pocket jacks is the nuts, well, then you should obviously not fold, right? A lot of players will assume, or will uh, make the mistake of overvaluing marginal made hands because... They, in their mind, they didn't sit here and wait for a premium hand only to have to fold it or play a small pot with it. They, they have their queens. They don't care what comes on the board. They're going to put all their money into the pot, period. 
And against those type of players, obviously, don't make big folds. Because even though they're starting with a strong range, they're taking that whole range and running it into your top pair second kicker. And against their whole range, you're actually in pretty good shape. But against you know only ace-king and better, you're not in good shape. You're going to be playing next week and taking what you learned in our challenge. Yeah, we have a 30-day tournament preparation challenge. I'm sure we discuss exploitative plays in that. If you want more information on that, that is part of Poker Coaching Premium. And Poker Coaching Premium is on sale right now. PokerCoaching.com slash fall sale. Check it out. Y'all keep trying to derail me here, talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, apparently, Mike Postel has, I don't know, doing making some lawsuit against me and every other person in poker media. I don't know anything about it. Haven't been served. Haven't seen it. Saw the first page, but the first page doesn't tell you anything. So when there's more information, assuming my lawyer says it is acceptable to speak about it, I will. I have to imagine whenever you're in a lawsuit, usually the lawyer will tell you not to speak about it because, um, well, for various reasons. So... I'm not especially concerned. How about that? Whenever they're suing me and ESPN and Poker News and Phil Galfond and Doug Polk and Dale Negreanu and a laundry list of other well-respected people in the poker community, um, I'm, I'm actually a, a small small fry in the group, which is which is nice, I think. All right. Does the opponent's bet sizing matter? Yeah, of course the opponent's bet sizing matter matters, Vincent. Um, whenever your opponent's like betting. 25% pot, you should obviously just not fold the top pair, right? But if they're potting it, then sure. What do you think about turning king, queen into a bluff on a river? I think that's way too fancy, and I would literally never do it. Um, I, I mean, I had a coaching session yesterday with a student. We're going to go over one of his hands in just a minute, where he loves making fancy plays. He thinks poker is about trying to outplay his opponents, and he realizes that he thinks this, and he's trying to correct it. Poker is about playing good, fundamentally sound poker, and then adjusting whatever you know they do wrong. The thing is, is that you usually don't know what they do wrong. And like Amir here saying, should we bluff with our king-queen on the river? Trying to get them to fold ace-king? You think someone's going to fold ace-king on the river if they're tight and they already have a third or half of their money in the pot? No. Don't get fancy, man. I mean, making elaborate fancy plays is only good if you know that your opponents are going to make a mistake against them. And you really want to be doing that, especially in things like tournaments where... One mistake could cost you your stack. It's just not, it doesn't make sense. Don't get fancy. You make money because your opponents play worse than you, not because you're some poker god. We can't all see our opponent's cards. And if you could see your opponent's cards, then sure, feel free to exploit them as much as you'd like because it's easy then. But I can't see my opponent's cards. And I have to imagine most of you cannot either. And if you can't see your opponent's cards and you have not played with them a lot, which most of the time you haven't played with most people for very long, um... You just can't really make big exploits. And things like river bluffing is a pretty big exploit. That said, like if you know the players in your games fold way too often to the river raise, then sure, consider it. Okay. Um, all right. We talked about the various player types. In general, there's one spot where you should not... Well, there's one spot where you should definitely make exploitative, make exploitative folds, and there's another spot where you should definitely not. So let's talk about this. In general, when you have taken a strong line, meaning like you bet the flop, bet the turn, bet the river, or you check raise flop, bet the turn, bet the river, if you're the one being aggressive, putting your money in the pot, it's going to be somewhat clear to most players that you have a good hand. Okay? So if you clearly have a good hand and your opponent is still raising you, whether they're a maniac, a nit, a normal player, a good player, or whatever, they have to have a good hand too. And that's going to be even more true if they think you're generally on the tighter side. Now, if they think you're insane, maybe the insane people also try to rebluff you or something, but that's a corner case. Um, for the most part, if you are blasting it and your opponents then re-raise you, they have a very good hand. Or at least they have a really good polarized range, period. So if they have a really good polarized range and you have a hand that is good but non-nut, you probably should make big folds. And that's because your opponent knows you have something good. They're still wanting to put their money in the pot, so you should typically get out of the way. The other side of the coin of this, though, is that whenever you take passive lines and weak lines, even though they may not necessarily be weak if you're balanced, if you take weak lines in your opponent's eyes, you should definitely not fold. I'm a hand one of this, one of my students played the other day. He raised nines under the gun. The uh, player in the on the button three bet, he called. Flop came six five two. He checked opponent bets. He called. 
as you should. Everything's fine and good so far. Turn was a five. It goes check, check. River's a six. Our hero checks, as he should. Opponent bets. This is a tight opponent. Pretty straightforward so far, but again, only 200 hands or something, so not a lot of hands. And that's a spot where with an overpair, you just have to call. Why? Because your hand is too good. Um, we talked about this earlier. If you know you're against a nit, you probably should at least consider folding here. But even against a nit, I'm going to call, because if you give that nit king-queen or random uh, random unpaired cards on the river, they're going to at least consider bluffing it. And if you give them even like ace-high, they may just random randomly bet it because they don't know what they're doing. And, I mean, yeah, you're going to lose to aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, a lot of the time. But in this scenario, his opponent bet half pot, so he needed to realize 25% equity. And how often are you good here? I don't know, 30, 40, 50% of the time, maybe more. Um, so if that's the case, if you're good 30% of the time, and you only need to be good 25% of the time, calling makes money. So you got to find the call. It feels gross making the call. You don't like it. But that's a spot where you have a very easy call, because if you think about the line that our hero has taken, his hand looks really weak, right? I mean, he did raise under the gun, which is strong, and he called a 3-0, which is strong, but he just check, called a flop bet, check, check, turn, check the river. Like, you can't really play this hand any more passively after the flop, right? So when you take a very passive line like this, you have to call, because you've induced bluffs. So when you've induced bluffs, you should be way, 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 way more inclined to call. And when you've played your hand very aggressively, you should be way, way, way more inclined to make big folds. And that really is the main adjustments to when you should be making big folds. Because if you take a strong line and your opponent wants to put money in fold, if you're against a tight player who doesn't do a lot of bluffing, or you're against a player who normally plays aggressively or normally, but they're very tight on the turn in the river when it comes to applying aggression, you should fold. Um, but besides that, you should really just be playing good, fundamentally sound poker, right? In poker coaching, it's mentioned that I mean, it's mentioned that you should rarely three bet under the gun players. Should you treat a three betting strategy like playing against low jack six handed or more like under the gun? Not sure what you're referring to, Michael because I don't know the exact scenario you are talking about. All right, let's see. Should we play at the Venetian? I would generally recommend not playing at the Venetian because some of your money is going to go towards trying to make online poker in America not allowed. That said, you know, if it's the biggest game in town and you want to play the biggest game in town, what are you going to do? You recently played against a guy who always calls with two suited cards no matter what they are, he would fold to him. He would 3x suited hands. Um, good. So guys don't have way too many bluffs in their range. If your opponent has way too many bluffs in their range, that is fantastic. All right. Bet sizing is always relevant. If you get check raised on the flop with middle pair and turn trips, and the river pairs the top card, do you call a half pot shove? If you have a weak full house, are we calling a bet? Uh, yeah, probably. Again, that's an example of a big fold. You have to ask, is this one of the best hands in my range? And if it is, then you just cannot fold. And if it's not one of the best hands in your range, then you can easily fold, right? So whenever you're trying to make calls on the river, you have to ask, do I care about being unexploitable? And maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you don't, then just play based on whatever you think your opponent's doing. However, understand that what you think your opponent is doing, in quotation marks for those listening and not watching the video, means you actually know with a pretty good idea what they are doing. And almost always, if you're playing against people who you've not played a lot with, you're not going to know what they are doing. You may have suspicions, or you may think that you know what they're doing, but you're not going to know. And you need to stop thinking that you know what they're doing. Um, whenever you're playing, whenever I'm teaching students who think they know how to outplay their opponents, they'll give me some like elaborate thought process of why they would do this because they think this and all this nonsense, basically. And what it amounts to is you don't know what your opponents are doing. So, to some extent, you just should not fold the best hands in your range ever. <laughs> and if you fold the best hands in your range, it's because you know your opponent is a super nit, or you've taken such a strong line to the point that them bluffing would be ridiculous. There's actually a video where I discuss um, Kim Lim. She folded quads um, deep stacked in a cash game when she got like five bet on the river or something, when you know straight flush was available. And straight flush was certainly possible given the way the opponent played it. She folded. Uh, normally, you're not trying to fold quads, but I think it was probably a good fold. You can find that video on YouTube. It has a bunch of views. Apparently, you all like folding four of a kind. Um, or maybe you don't like folding four of a kind, I'm not sure. But 
if your opponents are, I mean, are they five bet in the river whenever you could have the quads? Like, no, they're not five bet in the river when you could have the quads unless they have the knots, right? So that, that was a very abnormal case. But if you take strong lines and your opponents still want to put in their money, that's really the only time you should even consider folding big hands. And even then, I still just call pretty good hands. You learn the most about integrity from a poker player. Well, I do my best. I do my best. Nightbot's going off here. Do you view raising the raising range of under-the-gun six-handed differently than under-the-gun nine-handed? Yes, absolutely. You're asking, should you play different ranges from under-the-gun versus under-the-gun six-handed? Yes. Under the gun nine handed is very different than under the gun six handed because under the gun six handed is just the low jack seat. The low jack seat's range is substantially tighter than um, under the gun nine handed. What happened to PLO content? I, I don't have any PLO content. Do we ever launch it? No, we've never launched any PLO content because I do not view myself as being a very, very good, strong PLO player. If you want PLO content, check out the work of Jay Nandez. I think he does good work. Um, Let's see. Poker games are 50% luck. I mean, poker games are a lot of luck in the short term. I mean, this is just like a... The idea of this poker luck or skill is just so asinine because obviously it's luck in the, in the short term and obviously it's skill in the long term. Just like basically everything else in life, like baseball and football and hockey and basketball, any game that has unknown information or variance has luck involved. But at the end of the year, every season turns out the teams that were pretty big favorites at the beginning of the season very often make it to the end of the season is still there, right? And in, in the hunt to win. And poker is similar, where on any individual day, obviously anything can happen, but every time you play, you're you're winning some amount of money if you're good and you're losing some amount of money if you're bad. And you capture that in the long run. Best way to start playing professionally, learn to do it as a hobby. If you can play poker and profit enough to make a living as a hobby, then consider doing it professionally. Do you ever commit to bluffing with a terrible hand before the flop? No, don't play terrible hands before the flop. Typically, we are betting with our terrible hands after the flop when we have a draw or of some sort. Do we have sit-and-go content? A little bit, not a ton. Purposely, um, I, I don't really want people to be studying sit-and-goes because I don't think it's a great use of your time because sit and goes do not run at high stakes, and the ones that do run at high stakes are not profitable to play. My job as a coach is to funnel you into poker games that you can make money at, that I can help you make money at. And I don't want you learning, I mean, you can learn whatever you want, right? But I'm not going to spend substantial time and resources helping you learn a game that doesn't have a whole lot of a future. And certainly you can make, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 bucks an hour playing sit and goes, if you're really good at it. But I'm trying to teach you all to make hundreds of dollars per hour. How long did it take you to become a profitable poker player? Not long. I started with 50 bucks. I played small stakes and I was profitable pretty much immediately because I'd already read about 10 poker books back in the day. There were no training sites back when I started. Is there a difference between when you should make exploitative folds and when you should make exploitative calls? Well, basically the opposite. I mean, we talked about this, right? Like if you look weak because you've done a lot of checking, that's when you should make big calls. But if you've been aggressive, that's when you should be making big folds. Really, the opposite of everything I said today is for when you should be making big calls, right? Like make uh, make big folds against tight players, make big calls against loose players, right? Online, a lot of crazy stuff happens when you're all in preflop versus playing out of hand. Yeah, online poker's not rigged, get over it. And uh, to be fair, Seaboss kind of nails it here. That's because a whole lot more hands are played preflop. Or a whole lot more hands are played online, right? You play three, four, five times as many hands online as you do live. Ari says, fancy play syndrome used to be why you lost in poker. You had the name as the most creative player in the room, but against people who know what you're doing, it won't work. It's exactly right. So you stop. Like, for example, let's say you're known to just always check raise the river because you think people fold the river too often. What is a good player going to do? They're going to get to the river and only bet with good hands that can call a raise. And then they're just going to crush you, right? And it's easy to play against someone whenever you know what they do wrong. Seven-handed on the button, under the gun raises to four big blinds, two callers, you three bet to 22 big blinds. Well, I, you sure better have a good hand. Aces, kings, queens, jacks, or ace, king is the only thing I'd three bet here. Everybody calls. How do you adjust this kind of table? Yeah, just three bet the best hands. Exactly what I just said, right? Only three bet the best hands in these scenarios. You don't want to be doing any three bet bluffing. Also, when under the gun's raising four big blinds, I mean, that's pretty pretty strong, typically. Obviously, they may just be raising all sorts of nonsense. Um... 
It's not a great question though. If you know you're going to get called a lot, though, you want to be value betting. Strong linear range. How wide the strong linear range should be is the question. Widest it could be maybe like nines are better, ace drag suited better, ace queen off suit, and king queen suited, if I had to guess. You'll take your quads to heaven and beyond. So this kind of thought process is close-minded to some extent. And because, what if quads is the third or fourth or fifth nuts? You're really not going to fold it? Like, let's say the board is king, king, jack, jack, nine. Three clubs. King, jack, and nine of clubs. So you have third nuts here, right? Make it even worse. Let's say it's a queen, jack, ten. Queen, queen, jack, jack, ten. You have pocket jacks. Queen, jack, ten of clubs. So now there's three straight flushes available. So three, four, five. So you have the fifth nuts. Obviously, you, I fold the fifth nuts all the time when it makes logical sense, right? So you're saying you won't fold the fifth nuts? Why not? Should. Should fold the fifth nuts a decent amount. Does the poker player in Alliance still exist? I don't know. Um, I have not really worked with them so much in the past because I've heard lots of things. But I'm not here to speak of things I don't know, right? This is not a gossip column here. All right, you three bet a lot and expect your opponents to play back sometimes with their blockers because they should. But that is just not happening whenever you call with hands that dominate what they should be shoving with. They just show you the nuts. Um, yeah, Louis Philippe, I would say that in general, some people just only play the best hands. They just only, oh, they don't care what you're doing. I mean, you would think, I mean, look, I run into this issue too. It's like, how many times can you really three bet the people before they play back at you, right? And the answer is against a lot of players in small and medium stakes, like any amount, you can three bet as much as you want. They're just not going to play back at you. And I, I get that thought process of like, they got to play back at some point, right? But um, some people just don't. They play their strategy. They don't care what you're doing. All right. You think 888 is safe to play poker on? Yeah, of course. Any of the licensed regulated poker sites are perfectly fine. And even then, like, I, I don't think the unlicensed unregulated ones are like actively cheating you or anything. How can you play live cash games if you're underrolled? Well, you can't, I guess. Is that the answer you're looking for? Play smaller stakes. Don't play live, right? I started with $50. I mean, I understand that some people start with even less than $50, but I started with 50 bucks. I had 100 bets for limit hold'em. You can start playing games where you're playing like a $5 or a $2 buy-in, and you'll have, what, 25 big blinds right off, or 25 buy-ins right off the bat for the softest games on the internet? Then grind it up slow, man. You don't have to go fast. Everybody wants to get rich quick. And I'll tell you, people out there who are trying to tell you that poker is a get-rich-quick scheme are trying to defraud you, because it's not. This is a game where you're going to have to devote a lot of time, you're going to have to sit there, and you're going to have to grind. But nobody wants to grind like they have to grind, and nobody wants to play the small stakes like they have to play to make it. And that's why almost nobody makes it. Me and basically every one of my friends all started with almost no money. We all play, put in infinite hours over and over and over and over again for many years. And it turns out whenever you do that, you'll end up making it. But if you just want to play one tournament a week and goof off with your friends, and you want to win all their money every time, like, hate to break it to you, it's just not going to happen. How do you think about playing 20 no limit with 200 euros? Is that manageable? You have 10 buy-ins? That seems ridiculous to me. Read jlpoker.com slash bankroll. I would be playing like five, like a two, two, dollar, two, euro, two, two dollar buy-in total, or a five dollar buy-in total. Take it slow. Don't be in a rush. Some people think it's all about luck. Thank God they still exist. Yes. You play 100 big blinds cash games. There's a home game where it's one, two, five. One, two blinds with a $5 limp. What should you consider 100 big blinds? Uh, $5. Well, it's a $5 call. I don't know. Probably $5, right? You're loving the new book. Well, Thomas, thank you. If you all enjoy my new book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games, here it is. Go leave a review for me on Amazon, on Goodreads. I would appreciate it. We have content by some of the absolute best poker players in the world here at the bottom bottom corner. We have Vlada. You see Vlada here? Oh, that's the wrong corner. You see Vlada? Vlada, I always forget his last name. Stojanovic. It's hard for us silly Americans. Vlada Stojanovic, world-class player. He won the Poker Star Stadium Series for a million bucks right before this was published a month or two ago. We also have John Van Fleet. He crushed that series too. Bert Stevens, Giraffe Ganger, absolute legend, the poker coaching coach. By the way, poker coaching's on, uh, on sale right now, pokercoaching.com slash fall sale. He streamed the other day for our premium members. It was a lot of fun. I watched the whole thing, and I learned a lot about PKO tournaments. 
We also have um, Rob Tenyon. He won the Sunday Million twice. Now he manages Pokar to some extent. We have uh, Rich Hoadley. You may not know him, but he is one of the most well-respected poker players and coaches in the game. His chapter's on <laughs> using the solver to figure out if you're making big, good punts or bad punts. <laughs> some of them were not good. Uh, but anyway, check it out. jlpoker.com slash tough. It's a good book. It's a big book. It's not an easy book. If you're a beginning poker player, do not get this book. This book is if you already understand poker pretty well and you want to really up your game. Um, if you're a beginning player, check out pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. I have a lot of free content there for you to get you up to speed. Anyway, leave a review for that book. And if, I'll tell you what, if you have not read this book, leave a review for one of my other books. I really would appreciate that. That kind of thing really does help content creators more than you would think it possibly does because it lets other people and the internet know that you all enjoy our work. All right. What are we talking about here? You love the new book. Good. How much harder do you think today's game is compared to when I started? Decently harder. But, I mean, still certainly beatable. Took down a small tournament. Congrats. You have an image as a lag. How do you make the most of it? Don't bluff as often, right? If you if your opponents think you're crazy, and they're, that means they're going to call you more, then don't bluff as often. I'm a great, hardworking coach. Well, I do my best. Thank you. All right, all right. Hand example. 10-8 offsuit. Defend big blind against under the min raise. Jack 8-4, you check. They bet. You call. Turn to 7, you check. You lead. I would never lead here. Um, you want to be leading here with your best made hands and your draws. I do understand that 7 is good for your range, but I don't think it's necessary to lead with this hand. Although maybe it could be okay, but I'm, I would not lead. I would just check again. You lead. He calls. You know he has a hand, but you know it's... But you know it's your range. Um, no, I mean, the opponent could just have, like, ace-jack or overpairs, right? Rivers is two, you shove all in. No, I would I would literally never do this. Like, if I'm going to be bluffing here, I'm going to be bluffing with, like, queen-10 and queen-9 for gut shots. And if I'm leading, I'm also leading with stuff like um, two-pair. So in this scenario, if I'm leading, jack-8, 4, 7, it's going to be with two pairs that are vulnerable to being outdrawn and draws, like gut shot straight draws or open-ended straight draws. So I'm not, I'm not leading with made hands at this point. There's just no, no point in that. You have plenty of bluffs. Everybody wants hand examples today. You're all trying to derail me, huh? All right. 2-5, no limit. 600 deep, 7-handed, under the gun. Opens to 45. You're in the low jack seat with ace-king. You 3-bet to 175. Okay, you're making it... Why is everybody making it huge? Oh, I guess it's, uh, there's a straddle. Fish, button, straddle, calls. Leaving 225 behind. Under the, go, 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 under the gun goes all in. Can you call? I don't know. What do you think of their range? Solvers are helpful, but taking notes about your opponent's lines and tendencies is the most important part to you. See, boss, you got to understand that solvers tell you how to play if you input what your opponent does. So if you know, for example, your opponent bluffs too often on the river, quantify it. Say which hands you think they're bluffing too often with on the river, and then solver will tell you what you should do. So why would you not want to know what to do? I think, like, people who say this type of thing, I think, don't understand what solvers actually do. Or maybe you see very basic things that people do with solvers. I mean, there's a lot of, like, cheap programs out there that just put out basic GTO solutions. But, I mean, you need to exploit your, your opponents or whatever they do wrong. Don't just plug it in against a GTO opponent. Because, obviously, your opponent's not GTO. I hope that's clear. Again, I'm, I'm listen, everybody. I'm not going to be reviewing all these hands that you all are typing. I appreciate you typing all these hands. I want to make sure we're talking about the things we're talking about today. Um, if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you can send us, you can submit hands. I've been reviewing some Poker Coaching Premium students' hands, and uh, I post videos of myself reviewing them. So that's a great way to get your hands reviewed by me. Lessons have been incredibly helpful. Well, thank you. Also, you can get a discount right now to Poker Coaching Premium at pokercoaching.com slash fall sale. All right. Sit and go grinders. Hello, grind it up. I ever played in Columbia. I have not, unfortunately, but maybe I'll get to one day. Deep in tournament, should you call an all-in with ace-jack? Depends on the pot odds, right? How much money should you put into your poker setup? What's your setup mean? Your computer? I don't know. You need a good computer to play online. Well, at least a reasonable computer. I don't think it has to be anything great, but you need to be able to run Hold'em Manager and the poker, poker site. You think playing micros is a thing, or play micros just to get your ranges down while you're moving up? Um, you can you can win money to micro stakes. Like I know poker uh, party poker is making the rake lower in their micro stakes. Like that's a great place to play if you have access to it. Uh, 
Um, thanks for all the free content. You're welcome. Let's see. You've been playing for two years, and you reached the level to be break even, but you feel like you don't improve. You haven't improved in the last three months. Any advice on how you can fix your leaks? Yeah, figure out what your leaks are. Right? I don't know what you're doing wrong. You need to pinpoint them and then then make adjustments. You need to be reviewing your hands, sharing your hands with friends, hiring a coach, watching other people's videos and seeing what they are doing that you're not. Right? You need to figure out what you're doing differently than people who are winning and then implement that into your game. Have been to the Aussie Millions? Yes, it's a great place. I love the Aussie Millions. One time I went to um, Australia and I went all up and down the, the coast, the, I guess it's the east coast, after for like, Three weeks is a lot of fun. It's a great trip. Don't know if we'll do it again for a long time, but um, it was fun. Way more difficult to do with two kids. You have 50K in cash, but no job anymore. <sighs> Better figure out a way to turn that money over real quick and make some money. That said, you probably just need to get a job and keep your pile of cash, right? You have 2,800 in your bank account. Should you play a $550 tournament? You know of my bankroll strategy. What are my thoughts on taking shots? Um, well, if you know my bankroll strategy, then you should know my thought on taking a shot. I would never put a fifth of my bankroll into a tournament, especially a random $500 tournament. It's going to be way tougher than your normal games. This is a good example. Again, people just want to try to get rich quick. You can do it if you want to gamble, right? But if you want to make it long-term, it's terrible. You leave a positive review on Amazon. Thank you, Ross. I appreciate it. You like the PKO stuff. Good, good, good. Is Excelling at No Limit Hold'em still up to date? Yes, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em is actually a pretty recent book, and a lot of the stuff in that book is very, very timeless. Wow, Her Herbert's just going off reposting this hand. You know this is not a good way to get me to review your hand, right? Um, I'm thinking about just ignoring it. I'm going to review it, but understand, Reviewing hands live on air like this, where you just like type out a block of text, is not a good experience for the viewer. That's why whenever people submit me hands, it's in a hold manager format. I can easily go through it. I can go through it quickly. I know exactly what's happening. I won't make any mistakes. So this is like, maybe we'll just have a hand review day but, or something, but this is not a great format for reviewing hands. Anyway, 1300 deep, you make it 30. Big blind makes it 130. I would just four bet and get it in. I mean, I don't know how deep we're, play, deep we're playing in terms of big blinds. You didn't even list it. But I would just four bet and get it in. You, I mean, if you made it three big blinds, the guy's kind of shallow at 90, 90 big blinds maybe. Four bet and get it in. Whatever, flop. Ace, 10, 7. He bets. You call. Turns a jack. He bets. You jam. I would never jam turn. Um, I would always call, and then I would always call the river. You want to keep your opponent in with a wide range of nonsense. If you want soft sit and goes, global poker sit and goes, Nick says. Okay, sure. How do you make the trade off between three betting and flatting versus weak players? You want to play post flop with them, but you also want to pick up the pot directly. Yeah, that's a tough thing that you always want to try to figure out and consider. Uh, as we are deeper stacked, I'm more inclined to call because picking up the pot immediately is not all that valuable, right? You want to make good post flop hands and stack them. But as you get shallower, like 30, 40, 50 big blinds, I'm going to be doing way more three betting because then winning the pot immediately becomes more valuable. So that's, that's typically the adjustments I'm making. Getting good results in bounty tournaments. You can't seem to win. Well, understand there's a lot of variance, right? Three days is nothing. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of variance in three days, right? Okay. What kind of resources should you use? I mean, are you are you using a PKO bounty calculator? Definitely use a bounty calculator. We have that for free at Poker Coaching in the tools section. Make sure you get that. We have a little bit of PKO content at PokerCoaching.com. Go through that. Like I said, if you're a premium member, DraftGanger sat there and played PKO tournaments all day, like 10 hours long for all of you. So check that out. I mean, all I can do is give you the resources, right? You can get in that PokerCoaching.com slash fall sale. How do you recommend your new, or do I recommend my new selling at Tough No Limit games for someone playing 10 No Limit? Yeah. If you're already like a decent, strong poker player and you want to get good, find good players and learn from them. And that's what I try to do when I collaborate with all these players. Again, deep in tournaments, should you call shoves with Ace Jack? It depends. What are our pot odds? What's the positions? What are the ranges? This is a question that is not just do you call with ace-jack? Because if your opponent's range is a bunch of nonsense, it's an easy call. And if the range is all the nuts, it's an easy fold. 
And if you're 100 big blinds deep, it's an easy fold. And if you're 20 big blinds deep, it's often a call, right? And is it too late to get in the 30-day challenge? I'm pretty sure if you sign up to Poker Coaching right now, you can still get in the 30-day challenge and also any of the past challenges we've done. Long-time follower on YouTube, first time watching live. Welcome, Richard. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for all the awesome cybernetic. You all think I'm a robot, don't you? All right. Middle of the tournament, 45 big blinds, table leader as who table leader doesn't matter. Under the gun, open jam, 72 folds. You on the button with queens. You call it off. Depends on what the opponent's doing. Have they ever done this? Is this a normal play? Usually they're going to show you ace king, but I typically just call and don't worry about it. All right. You're not supposed to use solvers in real time. Indeed. I do want to mention that some, uh, I think uh, GG recently put out new terms and conditions saying you cannot use any chart at all that that has stack depths or mixed ranges, something along those lines. So don't break the terms and conditions, okay? If the, if the site says don't use any chart, you sure better not have it up on your computer when you're playing. So, I mean, like, I know I've made resources for my students that, like the, the GTO charts on, your, uh, on the poker coaching app, um, you better not have those up when you're playing. It's against the rule. So make sure you follow the rules of the game. It's nice whenever the sites make it clear what the rules are because you can just follow them, right, and not get in trouble. But um, it's way more difficult when they don't make the rules clear. But fortunately, they've made the rules very clear. You don't use any charts of any kind while you're playing on GG. Some of the other sites have similar rules, like uh, Bet Online has similar, similar rules. Um, so anyway, be careful with it. They're probably not going to do anything unless you're playing, with, playing and crushing the high stakes, but I, you might as well not break the rules. Someone said the other day, like, that's nowhere near crossing the line. And you have to understand that what you think the line is or what the line actually is doesn't matter if they've clearly defined the rules, right? If they clearly define the rules, don't use charts on our site. Don't use charts on their site. And if you break the rules, then you deserve whatever punishment they say. And they make it very clear there the punishment is being banned and your money being taken. Money being confiscated. I ran out of air when I was saying that sentence. It's a long sentence, I guess. So anyway, you know the rules, you know the punishment. Don't, I mean, figure out if it's worth it, I guess. But it's probably not. Just learn to play good poker. That's the right answer. Regarding bankroll management at the smallest stakes, I think it'd be fine to play outside your bankroll for like only 10 buy-ins if you can replenish it. Well, it's not really your bankroll if you can replenish it. If you can replenish your bankroll, your bankroll is way bigger than it actually seems to be, right? J-R-F. Send us an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. Also, you probably want to check start at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals and the fundamentals course. That will be in the courses tab, I believe. But yeah, send us an email and tell us your scenario. Don't write us like a 10-page essay, but you know, send us, send us a paragraph about you and we'll send you to whatever we think makes most sense. How much should you have in your bankroll before buying things like hold manager, ICMIs, or poker coaching, etc.? Interestingly enough, if you're not a good poker player, these are the things you need way more than when you're even like a very, very world-class player, right? So you have to ask, how devoted to poker are you? If you're devoted to anything, whether it be poker or basketball or tennis or hockey, I hate to break it to you, you have to spend a little bit of money getting a decent setup. Um, you need to, like, if you're gonna play online, you better have a computer. You gotta buy a computer. It costs a few hundred bucks, right? You should probably have a thing program like Hold'em Manager and PokerCoaching.com to study. Why would you play poorly when you could invest a little bit of money? I mean, poker coaching is not even all that expensive. We did the math. It's like two dollars a day to have access to everything on the site. If you're not willing to spend two bucks a day to have access to everything on the site, I mean, like, what, what do you want from me? I mean, you're you're playing for. 5, 10, 20, 20 bucks. Seems kind of silly to not spend money making sure that you're decent. Making sure you're tracking your results, making sure you're studying, etc. right? Make sure you're being wise. Why is it is online poker illegal in most of the United States? Well, I, what is illegal is a company a, playing in a game where the company takes a rake. So that's online poker, live poker, etc. If, if those companies are not legally uh, licensed and regulated, right? Why is it illegal? Um, lobbying, for the most part, if I had to guess. You saw in a previous video that I'll be updating my cash game class. Yes. Is the update only going to be for Poker Coaching Premium members? Uh, I don't know. Send us an email. Support at PokerCoaching.com. Anytime you have questions about billing, payments, what you have access to, etc., don't don't ask me that because I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm, I can find the answer, but I'm not going to find the answer right now in the middle of the show. 
The charts on your phone? Oh yeah, Ordinary Man. Have you not seen the poker coaching app? It's amazing. You need to download the most recent update to it. I mean, it's been out for a little while now. But there are GTO charts right at the top. Um, if you are not even a member of poker coaching, you'll have access to some of the charts. If you're a standard poker coaching member, you'll have access to a few more of them. And if you're a premium member, you'll have access to all of them. And that'll be great. I mean, I'm telling you, it's good. It's good stuff. It took us a lot of time and effort to make it, but we did it. For a micro stakes player, do you recommend Hold'em Manager or Poker Tracker? They're the same thing. They're the same program, everybody. Everybody thinks there's like some big difference. They're the same thing. You consider specific parts of your older books outdated. Interestingly enough, my next book project is rewriting my first book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker. And basically all of it was accurate back then. I just didn't know why it was accurate. Um, some of the things that I recommended were definitely exploits for the player pool. Like I said, continuation bet a lot, right? Because people fold it too often. And that's true. People fold too often. You should continuation bet a lot. But I went through and like completely revamped a lot of the sections and made the thought process substantially more clear. Instead of just saying what to do, I said why you should be doing what you're doing and also how to figure out what play you should be making in all the spots you're likely to be in. People just, in small six games, people see the flop. Well, you have to learn to play post-flop, right? Play a little bit looser, flop well, most of the suited type hands, suited connected type hands, and go from there. So a lot of people think incorrectly that the only problem with online poker sites is that they have run money through the bank, but that is not correct. If you offer games where you take a rake to American citizens and you're not legally regulated in the jurisdiction where you're operating, you're breaking the law. So there are some sites that only operate in cryptocurrency, let's say. A lot of people think those are legal because they're not breaking the bank transfer laws. And to be fair, they're not breaking the bank transfer laws, but they're breaking the offering a game that takes a rake that is not regulated to Americans law. So there's multiple laws at work here. Some sites break all the laws, <laughs> and some sites break fewer of the laws. That said, you know, it's hard to prosecute a company that's uh, not in America or any other major country. Louis Philippe says, we have daily poker coaching study sessions on Discord right after a little coffee. Great. <laughs> Unlike other communities, you accept anybody in your sessions. Awesome. Get in there. Make sure you're studying with Louis Philippe. There's a um, community tab in... Poker coaching, there's a dis link to the Discord right there. All right, what's the difference between run it once? Very good poker slide as well, and poker coaching. To sum it up, I'll tell you why I think poker coaching is better, although, full disclosure, I'm a member of run it once, and I think it's a very, very good training site. Um, Run It Once does have more cash game content, especially like high stakes cash game content, because I realize basically none of the students here are playing 200, 400, no limit. So, you know, I don't feel like I need to provide 200, 400, no limit content for you, all of you. They have PLO content. If you want to learn PLO, Run It Once is a good place to go. Um, Jane Nan does as well, right? Um, Run It Once does not have, though, the interactivity that poker coaching has. We have lots of courses that have like a five or 10 minute video, and then a quiz right after it. We have the challenges that all have quizzes to make sure you're learning. We have our interactive quizzes where you play through hands. We have over a thousand of these. We have um, the homework where every month I ask you how you play your whole range in various scenarios, right? So Run It Once has lots of good high level videos and they lack the interactivity. And that, that's a big difference. GG Poker Stars or Bet Online, which would I recommend to play and why? Well. Bet Online operates unlicensed and unregulated, so not that one. Um, I, would, I mean, Poker Stars is what I would say the most legitimate of the bunch, GG being second, Bet Online being third. If, if you have access to Stars and GG, though, I would generally recommend picking which one you want to play based on whether or not you want to use a heads up display, because GG allows, or does not allow heads up displays. Poker Stars does allow heads up displays. Is the 80 big blind chart suitable for 100 big blind deep cash games? Um, no, it's going to be slightly off. Because in cash games, there's no ante, right? Also, again, the charts assume the opponents play well, which is probably not the case in a lot of cash games. Do you know why Sheldon is so against online poker? I think because he wants you to go play at his casino, specifically at his casino. Are you friends with Brent Kenny? We're friendly. 
He's not like coming over to my house every week, but no, we're friendly. I'm friendly with almost everybody in the poker world. Unless you are someone who actively tries to tear down the poker community, I probably consider us to be friends, <laughs> assuming I've interacted with you at all. And it turns out it's like most people in the poker world are, are pretty good people. They're trying to better the poker world. They're trying to help each other. But some people out there want to try to tear people down, and I'm usually not so friendly with those people, even if they're not tearing down me, because I realize that we are trying to build here and make poker a good, legitimate activity and not a um, scandalous, nonsensical activity. I looked into running some events where the award winner gets a buy into a tournament. I mean, we've done giveaways. Tournaments are hard because I don't want to run it on one of the various shady apps. Um, that's that's my big my big issue is I do not want to run it on one of the shady apps. And like, all the home game sites are kind of different. For a lot of the home game sites, they cap you at a number of players, and that's also bad. There's there's like a lot of issues. But I mean, like we just give away entries to tournaments. That's something we've done at Poker Coaching pre-COVID. Every month I give away thousand dollars worth of entries just to the students what do i think of coin poker i don't know anything about coin poker i know that basically every site though that's not big does not have high stakes who's my favorite pro to play against someone who's not very good <laughs> in terms of people who like i like playing with who are very good for i'm very fortunate to work with um three of them who i think are an amazing amazing players and amazing to play against i love playing with jonathan jaffe he's probably my favorite poker player you may not even know who he is um, but he's a poker coaching coach. He's won two WPTs, absolute crusher. And he, every time you play with him, it's an experience. He's going to show up with the most ridiculous hands. He's going to crush everybody. And it's a whole lot of fun. I love, I love playing with him, even though he's very, very good. I also love playing with Faraz Jaka and James Romero for very similar reasons. And fortunately, they're all poker coaching coaches now. So that's, I mean, I'm, I hired them because I realized, oh my God, these guys are super crushers. And I want to learn from them, right? At poker coaching, I often hire the people I want to learn from and then share it to all of you. KS, if you have any issues with the app, send us an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. I'm obviously not going to edit the app right now while I'm sitting here and I have a hard time writing stuff down. You enjoyed the webinar with Blaz. Yeah, one of our students, Blaz Zerzhal, scar maker. He turned 20 bucks into 1.3 million last year on Party Poker. Well, he did it again. He turned um, 1,000 into 550K last month. So he's absolutely crushing it. And we did a webinar. We reviewed a lot of his big hands. That's available for all poker coaching members in the classes tab. You saw my documentary. Yeah, um, I have a pokerography episode. You can go to jlpoker.com slash pokerography or search that on YouTube. It'll come right up. Jonathan Little Pokerography. It's a 30-minute biography about me and my life and how I got to where I am today. So check that out. How do you randomize your three bet bluffs? In reality, I just I don't do a whole lot of randomizing, mixing, etc. against the vast majority of players because it's not necessary. I just bluff the logical hands, right? Usually pertaining to relevant blockers, high cards, etc. What's my thoughts on Phil Ivey as a poker player? He's one of the best ever. I'm the Robin Hood of poker. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm the little John of poker, right? Six people at the final table. Short stack shoves, timid blinds, active middle stack calls, medium stack calls, you fold ace king, sure. If you're at a final table with pound implications, then obviously you should be folding there. Do the six-handed charts assume rake? Yes, that's why they're actually pretty tight. We have six max GTO charts at pokercoaching.com. Um, they assume there is rake. So that's that's that. Does my wife play poker? She plays poker a little bit. She's not a professional or anything. She actually final tabled last two charity tournaments she played. She got on TV. One of them was a WPT event. She was on TV for a split second. Um, and then the tournament before that, it was a guy named Will the Thrills Charity Tournament in New York City, and she won. So she won one tournament and final table another tournament. Back to back. Two for two. Um, that said, no, she's not a world-class poker player by any means. Okay. I feel like this turned into an Ask Me Anything. We started off talking about exploitative folds, but we ended up talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, by the way, so speaking of playing heads up with your wife or significant other, I think that's actually a really good thing to do. Um, it's a fun game. If, like, assuming you want to play a game with your significant other, you might as well teach your significant other to play heads up poker and play heads up poker. Like, I only beat my wife, like, 55% of the time. I mean, I tell her to play aggressive and she's good. And, um, it's a good game to play. I mean, if you're going to spend time, like, goofing off with your significant other doing nonsense, you might as well learn to play heads-up poker in the process, right? At least learn how to play against one particular player type. 
Will this cover win did not make exploitative folds? We already talked about that, Tom. Right at the start of the show. Don't make exploitative folds when your opponent is crazy. If your opponent's loose and aggressive and maniacal, don't fold. If you've taken a passive line, don't fold. Travis says, you officially joined poker coaching. Nice, congrats, thank you. And you're cramming content down your throat as often as possible. Well, so look, a, a problem a lot of people have with my site and some of the other sites that have been around for a long time, like Runner Once, which we talked about earlier, is that they have a lot of content. We have a lot of content. So don't be overwhelmed. And when, when you sign up, send me an email. Let me know your scenario, because everybody's in a different spot when they come to me. And I will send you to a few pieces of content that I think will be great to start with, or a course that's great to start with. And um, we'll get you on your way. But don't have information overload. Look at all these books back here, right? I haven't read all these books. I've read a lot of them, but not all of them. I have a whole other pile over here. I have seven books sitting right here I need to read. Like, I have a problem with information overload, so I get it. Um, fortunately, it's all online, so it's just, like, there. <laughs> so it's not, not a load of books. But I get that we have a lot of content there. And I get that we upload a lot of content. Because I realize everything's not for everyone, right? Like, if you play only tournaments, you don't want the cash game content I, I send out, right? Makes sense. So... Anyway, um, check it out, pokercoaching.com slash fall sale. Something I do that almost no other training site does is I have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you do not like poker coaching for any reason, if you think it does not add value, if you didn't learn something from it, ask for a refund. Send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com. Tell me you want a refund, and I'll give you a refund. Because if I don't help you get better at poker, I don't want or deserve your money. I'm not out here trying to rip off people or sell them a get-rich-quick scheme and vanish or anything like that. We're going to be here for many years to come. You can be very confident I am going to be heavily involved in the business. I know a lot of people in poker coaching businesses start them, get bored, and then leave. I'm not leaving. I'm not getting bored. I love helping all of you. And um, I'm happy to help. So you know I'm here for you. Who's the child in the picture behind me? That's my son, James. I should probably get one with my son, Thomas. I have two pictures of me and James, but I don't have any pictures with Thomas. I should probably get some is my course online. We have so many courses available at pokercoaching.com. I'm telling you, just go and check it out. How many books do you read per month? Mm, it's tough. Sometimes I read a lot. Sometimes I read almost none. I go on like little spurts where I do some things a lot sometimes and then I do things none sometimes. So anyway, that's that. Hope you all have a great day. I have to go. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of your time. I know it's the weekend. I think it's today Friday. Today is Friday. Have a great weekend. Hope you enjoy it. You still collect tournaments online. Absolutely. Online poker is booming right now. I'll be playing somewhere on Sunday. So, good luck in your games. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Again, you want to be nice to Jonathan Little? Leave her a book review for excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em games. I really would appreciate it. On Amazon, Goodreads, wherever you bought it, it will really take you like one minute. And if you want to take your game to the next level, you want to study some over the weekend or, you know, over the next year, Get a discounted membership right now to Poker Coaching at pokercoaching.com slash fall sale. Thanks again for being here. Click like, click subscribe. Have a great, 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 great weekend. And I will see you again bright and early Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time for another episode of